Comfy, comfy, cozy. Comfy, comfy, cozy. Go, go, cozy. So today I want to talk to you about 10. Well, not 10. See, I read this thing that uneven numbers do better than even numbers on listicle videos. So however many I said in the title. Iconic American things that are actually Irish. Now, whenever I do these videos, it always takes me back to that moment in my big fat Greek wedding where they're like, everything is Greek. Now, give me a word. Any word, and I show you how the root of that word is Greek. Except everything is Irish, obviously. And everything is Irish. You're Irish, I'm Irish, he's Irish, this microphone is Irish. And I'll prove that today. Maybe not specifically about the microphone. So grab yourself a drink, preferably out of a glass that has my face on it. Everything tastes better out of me. And let's go, kicking off with Halloween. Now, I'm putting this one at the top because some of you probably already knew that Halloween's origins are from Samhain, an Irish holiday. Back in the day, Halloween wasn't about scoring the biggest candy bar. It was about dodging terrifying spirits from the underworld. Samhain marked the end of the summer and the start of the new season. And as a result, the veil between the living and the dead was temporarily... Wibbly wobbly. Uh, wibbly wobbly, timey wimey. This allowed spirits of the dead to visit the living, which in some cases was a good thing, but also in some cases was a bad thing. So to scare away those spirits, people would often dress up as equally scary things. And that's where the tradition of dressing up as stuff started. And then America joined in and you commercialized it. But we do like it though now. It has more candy. So you probably knew about Halloween and Samhain already, but this next one is probably going to surprise you. It's Starbucks, and in general, the whole American coffee scene. Now you might be thinking, Diane, no, it's thanks to Italy. However, you are wrong. Well, kind of right, it's also thanks to Italy. The Howard Schultz, the founder of Starbucks, was very much inspired by the Italian coffee scene. However, the community feel and vibe of the Irish tea room scene is what inspired him to create the ambiance that he did. And in turn, a lot of other coffee shops have followed Starbucks in what they do and how they do it. You may have heard that when something goes wrong with Irish people, we turn to a cup of tea. Would oh, you like another cup of tea there, mama? A cup of tea will solve a great many things that your therapist will not. So back in the day, people used to go over to each other's houses for cups of tea, but then there was outbreaks of diseases and stuff. So they started to make tea houses and coffee houses where people could meet potentially in an outdoor or indoor setting and get the tea as we call it today, the gossip. And yes, we are known to put a little bit of whiskey in our coffee and what is wrong with that? It just makes it more fun, right? Something else that used to be quite unique about Irish coffee houses was how people used to read literature or poetry aloud to audiences, sometimes even comedy shows. Ah, the Irish, we are a storytelling people. The whole ambiance of the Irish coffee slash tea shop scene was the fact that it was a community and friends getting together. And that was the vibe that Mr. Starbucks wanted to emulate when he brought Starbucks to the America. I mean, the Italians do coffee well, but they're not as friendly as us. Speaking in stereotypes and generalizations. Is my hand a different color than my face? It is. <laughs> Ah, oh, fake cat. Next up, this one you'll kind of know about, but you probably won't have thought about it so deeply. It's modern firefighting techniques. So you probably already knew that most of the firefighters in New York, for example, come from Irish communities. And that's because of all the immigration and where everybody came from. So as you can imagine, when the immigrants came over, their living situations weren't always ideal. And even in the most well put together houses, fires were a lot more frequent than they are now. So when you were living in very much a put together home, jam packed full of people and potential things that could start fires, fires happened. In fact, they happened so much that many of the Irish immigrants got together and said, why don't we form a brigade? Now, they didn't first call it a brigade. It was just a load of people who were passing out water buckets. You pass me the water bucket, I pass it on. You pass me the water bucket, I pass it on. But there was a great sense of brotherhood, community and culture in these groups. Eventually, people figured out, hey, the bigger guys are good for stuff like this and climbing up ladders and carrying people out of buildings. 
So yeah, if your house goes on fire, call an Irish person. Next up, this one shocked me, submarines. Now I know we are an island surrounded by water, so we should be like pretty good at water stuff, but I didn't know about submarines. So I, apparently a dude called John Philip from County Clare in Ireland invented the sneaky vessels. Born in 1841, Holland was actually a teacher to begin with, but he had a big interest in engineering and all things that go poo underwater. Which which was mostly fish at that time because boats were above the water. His interest actually sparked from his involvement with the Irish Brotherhood that were looking for a united Ireland. And he thought, hmm, wouldn't it be great if we could sneak stuff under the water to and from Britain? Then we could fight a big powerful navy like the British Navy and go undetected until we were like, Pow! we're here, we came underwater. In 1873, Holland emigrated to the United States where his dreams were actually realized because there was a lot more technology and people who knew stuff about things, stuff and things, who could help him realize his idea of an underwater thing where people could breathe. And most importantly, while he was refining his idea, he was able to get financial backing. Yay, America. God bless America. His early designs faced a lot of skepticism and setbacks <clears throat> in fact, his first vessel, Holland 1, was such a disaster that everybody was just laughing at him and made an unholy show of him. Ha ha ha, a thing that goes underwater where you can breathe. What a silly idea, they said. But ta-da! The Holland number 7. P-P-I. 6. The Holland number 6. Actually worked. He named his submarines after himself. I mean, you would, wouldn't you? The Diane. What would that be? What would that be? Comment below. So apparently he utilized a couple of things, including an internal customless combustion. <laughs> internal combustion engine. It could propel the surface and had an electric motor for underwater movement. A dual propulsion method that became standard in submarine design. Oh, also torpedoes. It was equipped with a pneumatic gun for firing torpedoes underwater, marking it as the first truly functional modern submarine. It was such a nice design, and then they just added killing stuff to it. Also, diving and surfacing tanks that are still used today. So yay for Holland, but boo for all the killing. And to this day, Holland is remembered as the father of the modern submarine. We all live in a yellow submarine, a top of margarine, a yellow submarine. Up next, vocabulary. Oh, no, wait. First, I want to say today's video is brought to you by people just like you. In case you hadn't noticed, I don't have a lot of video sponsors, but people like you are supporting this channel. You can do so through Patreon or channel membership and get things in return or just PayPal to buy the editor a Red Bull. If you're not in a position to do so, just leave a like, comment and subscribe. They're free, they're quick. People often ask, how can such a small channel have been going for so long? Because of community. Thank you so much, community. More on you in a minute. Back to vocabulary. So have you ever said so long when leaving a friend? If so, that comes from Ireland, where we say slán, slángafó, which means goodbye or goodbye for now. Or maybe you found something galore at a sale. That comes from the Irish term galore. There are other words you are probably familiar with, like phony and hooligan that you say every day. Well, probably not hooligan unless you're in a certain type of role. But they're all Irish words and they're in your vocabulary every single day. Hooray for Ireland. We're with you when you're talking. And the number one iconic American thing that you did not know is Irish is... The White House. Oh, yes, the residence of countless US presidents who you do or do not agree with. The backdrop of many Armageddon movies and apocalypses. The place where decisions for the world are made. All designed by an Irishman. Yay, Irishman. His name was James Hoban and he brought a little bit of Irish flair to your architecture. Did you know that the White House is actually an upscaled version of Leinster House in Dublin, which is one of our political buildings? Much older than the White House. Born in County Kilkenny in Ireland in 1758, Hoban was a pretty well-to-do dude and trained a Dublin society of Troy. He learned the principles of classic architecture, European style. In 1792, he actually won a competition after moving to the United States to design 
America's presidential home. We know it is the White House, but for the competition, it was just gonna be called the President's House. George Washington himself selected Hoban's design, saying it was unique and had a classic, beautiful architecture that he could see himself living in. His style itself is characterized by symmetry, perspective, and nods to classical Greek architecture. Ah, we're coming back around to the Greeks. See, Hoban, Hoban wanted to design, Hoban wanted to design, Hoban wanted to design, Hoban wanted to design something timeless that would fit in even in ancient Greece or the future as we are in now. His attention to stonework was something that made the design stand out as well as attention to proportions being in balance, which is very much akin to a lot of Irish architecture. And I think it's fair to say that his building did the job. It's certainly a building that architecturally has stood the test of time. It doesn't look out of place now. It still looks pretty modern, but yeah, I could see it fitting in back in the olden days. And there you have it. A couple of American icons with a touch of Irish genius. Which ones surprised you? And which ones did you know about already? Shout out today to a couple of patrons. Our first shout out today comes from David Wilford and it's to the lovely Kimura. We see lovely photos of this doggy all the time over on Patreon and love keeping up with all her antics. She gives her daddy lots of love and she's always a big feature in our hangout. So big hello to Kimura or woof from Chewy. Our second shout out comes from Brian Ediger and he wants to say a big array to his church family. He says, thank you for taking him in and giving him a chance to be your pastor. He says, we're small, but we can do great things together. Love hearing about little communities around the world. Thank you so much, Brian. Thank you so much, guys. That's it for today. See you on the other side. Bye. But wait, that's only six things, Diane. What happened to number seven? Denim jackets, blue jeans, cowboy boots, cowboy hats, but aha, uh -huh, denim jeans are from Ireland. Okay, now that's wrong. <laughs> My research was wrong. Denim jeans are not Irish. Never mind.